one of the points of walking through in this participatory manner the story of the crucifixion is to bring us to the point to where we identify with the characters. We hear the words coming out of our own mouths. We see people we know, our friends, saying these immortal words that have been repeated and even acted out like this for millennia. I must confess to you that standing up here, first time I've done this, reading the part of Jesus, it's incredibly lonely. You all are, are way out there. They're way over there. And here is Jesus, actually precisely as he is in the Gospel reading, entirely isolated, even though he might be surrounded by crowds. The only thing that he has is what God has put in him to walk out what he clearly acknowledges is a predetermined path. As it says in the beginning of the reading, he knows exactly all that is about to happen to him when he is in the garden and the cohort of the military soldiers show up to arrest him. It's striking because at every single point, he operates as one imbued with authority. He is not shaken. Different gospel readings bring out different aspects of what happened over the course of this three-day period. But in the Gospel of John, the central thing that one sees, first and foremost, is who he is as a man of authority. He is in charge. He is threatened by no one, not the soldiers. Even in their folly, as one scholar writes, they brought torches and lanterns to search for the light of the world. They bring weapons against the Prince of Peace. And even when he stands up and he says, I am he, the power of God so flows through him that they literally fall to the ground. They have to get up. It's almost comical. Here are these soldiers, lanterns and torches and weapons. And all Jesus does is speak who he is, and they fall backward in fear. He waits patiently. They right themselves, stand up, adjust their armor, hold again up their swords. And Jesus is the one who takes the initiative. Who are you looking for? Jesus of Nazareth. I am he, and he keeps going. If, it's, if I'm the one that you're looking for, then let, let the disciples go. They were not meant, you see, to bear the fate that Jesus knew was in fact in front of him. Fulfilling, as John describes, the scripture that not any were lost. It continues when he comes before Annas, the father-in-law of the high priest, he is questioned. It's about doctrine at this point because he is the high priest. And Jesus skillfully avoids any sense of entrapment. I have said nothing in secret. Every time I've spoken, it's been in public. Ask the people who have spoken to me. As it were, Annas throws up his hands, sends him to Pilate, who eventually, of course, I mean, sends him to Caiaphas, who, of course, eventually sends him to Pilate. Pilate was one of the most feared leaders at that time and in that location. He represented and even embodied all of the authority of Rome. He could literally do anything with any human being or any piece of property that he so choose. And yet, Jesus addresses him, I am sure, to Pilate's astonishment as an equal, actually even greater than an equal. You have no power over me if it were not given to you from above. He was not used to being addressed that way. No wonder later he is in fact afraid. 
He claims to be the Son of God. And when Pilate comes back to ask Jesus if you want to distill the phrase in the Greek, it literally means, what world do you come from? It's not a geographic question. It's a cosmology question. Who are you? Are you, in fact, deity personified? And all the way through, Jesus voluntarily gives himself up with determination and with poise, even in the face of unimaginable suffering. Jürgen Moltmann describes the crucifixion as profane horror. He is one from whom men hid their faces, it says in the 53rd chapter of Isaiah. A bloody rag of bones, Rowan Williams says, strung up on the cross, naked to the sun, completely captivated by the power of the cross, except by his voluntary submission, he yields to that authority. He does not, he is never ever a victim. He is always someone carrying out the mission for which he was sent by his heavenly Father. How else, even in the midst of unimaginable suffering, could he constantly at every turn, turn and look at human beings and address them? Any of us would be so terrified, because we at that point would have seen the crucifixions. We knew what was in fact awaiting. And yet even before Pilate, when Pilate asks him, are you king of the Jews? He turns and he says, in a way that is quite personal, are you asking this for yourself? Meaning, are you actually interested in who I really am? In other words, Jesus was even in that moment open to a conversation that could have been personal, that could have been directed, that could have in fact said something about the spiritual life of Pilate, even in that moment. Not just authority, you see, but also tenderness. Healing the high priest's slave named Malchus' ear after Peter had cut it off. Some scholars say that the reason Malchus is named in the gospel is because he was known. He was, in fact, perhaps someone who had become a convert through that very act of what he had seen in Jesus. Strung up before the cross, what does Jesus do? Woman, behold your son. Son, behold your mother. You see, it's not just powerful authority. It is both authority and tenderness. And I don't know about you, but the reason I come here on this day and in this hour is because I need both authority and tenderness from my God. It's more than just tenderness. It is more than just a martyr who is strung up for the sake of love. That's not the whole story, and especially in the Gospel of John. Jesus is never a martyr. Jesus is, in fact, a willing, voluntary sacrifice who gives himself up for the sins of humanity past, present, and future. You see, without authority, all that is left is a kind of weak and insipid sympathy. This is agnosticism, a God who may exist but in fact can do nothing. But without the tenderness, instead what you see, for some reason that is, escapes us, this man voluntarily yields to the authority of Rome as well as to Israel and to die. But for what? Authority without tenderness is, it's un, you can't understand it. It's, it's terrifying in a way. No, both. The authority to in fact impart forgiveness. 
the authority to, to always, even in the midst of this unbelievably horrifying situation, that compassionate turn toward people never, ever, ever ends. The writer of Hebrews says, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, ignoring its shame. What is the joy? The joy is by virtue of what he has done, striking down the power of evil, reaching out in love to bring forgiveness and healing. He is united with the very people whom it says God so loved who? The world that he gave his only son. The joy that is set before him is being united with, with us, with us. And what the crucifixion shows us he has, is that he has both the power to unite us and the love to draw us into that union unlike any other. John Stott writes this. He said, I have entered many Buddhist temples in different Asian countries and stood respectfully before the statues of Buddha, his legs crossed, arms folded, eyes closed. But each time after a while, I've had to turn away. And in my imagination, I have turned instead to that lonely, twisted, and tortured figure on the cross plunged into God-forsaken darkness. This is God, laying aside his immunity to pain, entering into our world of tears and blood and death. Over all human suffering, he boldly stamps another mark, and that is the cross of Christ. No matter where you are, no matter what you have endured or what you know in pain and suffering, in loss, in betrayal, in abuse, here at the foot of the cross, you meet your match, even greater, because he endured the worst to set you free, to bring mercy, to bring healing, to bring release from all of the anger, all of the pain, all of the isolation, all of the sorrow, and to pour into you a life, a life that only the Son of God could give us, marked by His mercy and His love. The invitation of this Good Friday is an invitation to join with him who died on the cross, enduring all that we could ever know and more, that we might be set free, that we might know a love that will not let us go, that we might know a companion even in the midst of the worst of suffering, because at no time, given all that he endured, no matter what happens to us, he never steps away and goes, that's too much. No, no, no. Instead, he stands beside, surrounding, pouring his grace and his mercy within us, so that no matter what we have to face, he still says to us, I will never leave you or forsake you. Nothing can take you out of my hand. So come. Ponder what has been done for you and for all that you know, and walk away knowing that saying yes to Him means you are joined to Him forever, and that no matter what you endure, He will never, ever let you go, because He loves you. Amen.